Good evening. I um sitting here looking at the tablet too like an idiot. Never dawned on me that hey, maybe you ought to start that up. Oh great, it's actually off. It does that. I have no idea why. It just randomly shuts off. Anyway, I hope uh hope you're all having a good weekend. I um I'm going to do something a little different tonight. I don't talk about the Father a whole lot. And there's a reason why. And maybe I ought to start off by explaining why that is. I can't seem to find anybody that can show me where in the Bible that I am supposed to put anyone in between me and the Father other than Yeshua. That's the only one. I can't find anywhere in the Bible where it instructs me to have a, a pastor, a minister, a priest, a rabbi, nothing. In fact, all I see is where it tells me to have a personal relationship. That's why it frustrates me when members of clergy will stick their head up high as if they're somehow above their brothers and sisters. The Father made that very clear, although some, apparently, can't conceive it. We are nothing more than anyone else. Period. End of discussion. We're not supposed to hold ourselves above anybody else. We're not supposed to hold our heads high, and we're not supposed to be prideful and vain about being a servant of the Father. I've talked before in the past about how I didn't just walk into this. This wasn't something that I was like, I want to be a pastor. I want to start working for God. Because at that point in time, I was, at least I thought, happily, or at least contently, being an atheist. I mean... I um, had no interest in following God. And in fact, I never even thought about God. <clears throat> and I've told the story before about how it was a joke. And we, all I can say is we serve an in incredibly good God. We serve a God that is smarter than you can even begin to imagine. We serve a God that, if need be, will walk you right into him. And that's exactly what happened. Again, it was a joke. I went to work one night and actually got in trouble by my supervisor because I lost it when my co-worker told me he was an ordained minister. Now, if you would have worked with him, if you would have knew him, you would have understood why that was so funny. That was freaking hilarious. And I actually got in trouble because I couldn't stop laughing. So I said, man, how... How in the hell did you pull that off? What did you do? He told me, like, you just go online, you go to a website, you just fill out the form. Okay. Well, when I say that I really wasn't interested in the Father, I was pretty much atheist. I, I didn't, again, I didn't even think about it. Not a thought in my mind. But I thought it was awful damn funny that I could go home and go to a website and fill out a few things and next thing you know, I was an ordained minister. Because that, once and for all, proved to
to me and the world that if I could get ordained, literally anybody could get ordained. And that was the joke. There's a reason why I was atheist. And it was because I can read. I can comprehend. I know that might sound a little strange. But that's the truth of it. I had read the Bible. More than once, actually. And I had also heard at least some different types of Christianity. I was raised, although loosely, Southern Baptist, very loosely, mind you. With, I could probably count on one hand how many times I remember going to church. My dad claimed to be a, a, a spiritual person, but it's not, to be honest, anything that we seen a whole lot unless he was playing music which we're going to get to that I am um, I thought well this is going to be fun because they had a Yahoo group back in the day Yahoo groups used to be a thing they had a Yahoo group and I'm not a malicious person I wasn't going to I wasn't going to use that Yahoo group to uh, to make fun of people, to, to, no. But personally, I was ready to laugh my ass off. And so, sure enough, after signing up for the Yahoo group, and by the way, before the evening was up, I done had the email back to me congratulating me on being an ordained minister. This was in 2005. And all of a sudden these Yahoo group emails started coming in. And I'm reading through them, getting ready to just absolutely lose my mind laughing. And what I saw was the very, very, very stark opposite of what I expected to see. He got me. He got me. You see, I was always taught, not just like something from my father, but I mean, it is a part of Christianity. I was always taught that you don't question the word. And when I heard you don't question the word, I heard that means you don't question them either. That's not the case. I learned real quick that the biggest reason I was an atheist wasn't because I was against the thought of God. Wasn't it? Wasn't because I didn't think that he had good ways to live. In fact, quite the contrary. I was actually a much better person than a lot of the people that I saw going to church every Sunday. I learned real quick that by questioning the things that I heard, wasn't questioning God, wasn't questioning God's word, but it was questioning the dogmas of man. Nothing more than the doctrines and dogmas of man. The very things that I could read and comprehend the Bible and not being one and the same. And we're talking about some of this stuff is applied by all Christian religions. I mean, look at today, look at Easter, look at Christmas. How many Christian religions do you know of that don't celebrate Easter, Ishtar, and Christmas? Not many. I can't count any on my fingers. So, there was a reason 
I wasn't stupid. I wasn't an idiot. And instead of reaching to the Father, instead of doing what even the book told me, though I didn't comprehend those parts of it, apparently. Coffee. I should have reached to him, and I didn't. And I, that is what it is. I can't change that. I'm just glad. I'm glad that he let me play a trick on myself. And that he led me to play a trick on myself. Because I would have never figured it out if I didn't do that. Them people in that Yahoo group taught me real quick that I was absolutely correct for questioning the things I did. I am... Um, I know I've talked about this, but I am going to bring it back up again because I, I want this to be a full story so so folks aren't wondering. I, I mean, they're going to be wondering anyway. But So after I did that, after I became, became ordained, it wasn't just the fact that people in the Yahoo group were talking, oh no, that's not what did it. That's not what flipped the switch in my head. Not even close. So, I got ordained through this online website. Started reading and actually reading. And I, I wasn't replying anything yet. I wasn't having conversations with anybody yet. But I was reading. I was reading every single email that came into the Yahoo group. And I was taking in as much of it as I could. But that wasn't enough. That wasn't enough. For two weeks after that evening, after that night I got ordained, for two weeks I kept seeing the name Jesus everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And I was heading home. It was a Friday. I was ready to get home. Ready to be done with the week's worth of work. And behind this damn semi. Now I'm coming right through town here actually. I was staying in a town at the time called Greenville. And I was on my way through Highland. And I passed an old place where I used to work a long time ago. Highland Supply Corporation, Jockey Street. <laughs> People lived here their whole life. They don't know how to spell it. So, I'm heading down Jockey Street, which is only like two streets away, except this was down there probably a good mile, close to it. And, like I said, there's a damn semi in front of me. And it's a real small street. It goes over railroad tracks by the old Wicks Organ Company, Wicks, Wicks Pipe Organ Company. And go over the tracks, and behind the semi, come on, come on. And it pulls out on 6th Street. You ain't got a ton of room there, so it takes semis a little bit of time to get out there without taking out signs and telephone poles and other cars. And this semi is making a left-hand turn, and I'm sitting there, you know, got the radio blaring. Come on, come on, I want to get home. And this semi has Jesus written on the trailer of the truck in huge letters down the side of the trailer of the semi. Jesus. I did not see this until that truck started turning. So I got out of there, make left on 6th Street, and um, I, I went into town actually for something. I went back out of town as I'm passing under an underpass, Trussell Road. I look over, and it's not, a, I mean, it's really not uncommon to be there, I'm sure. But sure enough, left-hand side, real big spray-painted Jesus. And at this point in time, I'm, I'm actually pissed off at this particular moment in time. I 
get home, the first thing I did was go downstairs where I had my computer set up at the time. Staying with a friend temporarily in, in a little town called Greenville. And I literally got on my knees. And I said, what in the hell do you want from me? He had my full attention. And at that point in time, he told me I was an infant. And then what, what he wanted me to do was learn. Learn about him. 2005, that started my journey. And I did. I, I learned as much as I could. Not just about him, but about all kinds of things. That's the way I've always been all my life. I've always been somebody that just wants to keep learning and learning and learning. Never knew why. Until all this, now it makes sense. So, I continued to learn several years go by. And my marriage just wasn't worth the damn, let's just be honest. Um, very shortly after I got married, it was almost like my wife turned against me. And the bullshit games that she'd play and all that, and I'm not excusing my actions, but I am saying there is a reason that may have pushed me to seek the affection of a different woman, of a, someone else. Again, I'm not defending my actions. My actions were wrong. There is no defense for that. But at the same time, it's not like I just up and decided, oh, hey, I want to find somebody else. That was not the case. That is not how I wanted to be married. That wasn't the married life that I wanted. But I, and I still feel this way to this day, I have a right to be loved. I have a right to be treated correctly. I have that right. And if that person isn't going to do that, then it's time to leave that person and find someone who will. And I don't suggest that anybody stay with somebody that makes them wholly unhappy. That's a hell. But I did seek the affection of another woman. And... I can't say that it wound up in a triangle because there was no triangle to it. But I was, at, at one point and for some time, I was married and we lived with my girlfriend. So it's not the most ideal situation in the world, right? My, By the way, I, and again, it doesn't excuse anything. It's just part of the story that you probably should know. My wife knew. I mean, I literally went to bed with not my wife. <laughs> so, I wasn't really happy living like that either. I just wasn't. I was miserable too. It's not how I wanted to live. I just wanted to be loved. And it wound up, I was in a situation where I wasn't loved by either one of them. And rightfully so. So I wound up losing my family before it was all said and done. Not for the reasons why my ex claims, but because I was a piece of crap when it came to that. Now she'll tell you that, oh, I was a violent person, I was horrible, I did this, I did... No, I cheated on her. I cheated on her for a long period of time. Never laid a hand on her. Not me. It's not in my nature. Anybody that knows me, actually knows me personally, will tell you. I'm about as nonviolent as it gets. I have no interest in violence or aggression from myself or anybody else. 
I will not sit there and argue with somebody, including a girlfriend. I won't do it. I will not do it. What's the point? And I've been that way for a long damn time. But I wound up losing them all. And it was a situation where I was in Alabama. My ex played her game, I think that was like the 13th time, literally like the 13th time that she played her game, going to a courthouse and lying her ass off to get the courts and the police to just get me the fuck out of the house. Pardon the language, but that's just the way it is. Like the 13th time, I kid you not. Same lies. She even wrote into one of the the judges here, right? And this is somewhere in the middle of all those times. And even wrote in there that it wasn't true, that she said it, she did that because she was mad. Absolutely freaking ridiculous that they keep handing them to her. But, that's the way the system is. But I need to explain all of that to understand how I got where I am today. That was 10 years ago that that happened. And in the first bit of time after all of that went down, I stayed a very short time with with a friend of mine that I, I went to high school with, her and her husband. And uh, not long there. And then, I, di- I mean, I didn't have nothing. I didn't have nowhere to go. I was, I was completely lost. I literally had to take a Greyhound bus from Alabama back to Illinois out of an entire lifetime. The only thing that I got to keep was what would fit in a medium-sized Alice pack, a duffel bag, and my computer tower. That's it. That is it. Out of an entire lifetime. I had a lot of stuff. I had tons of tools, you name it. I had all kinds of stuff. Prepping stuff, yes, because I had already started prepping. So I essentially had to start over completely from scratch. And so I went and I stayed with with my buddy and his family. Which is another step I think that God needed me to take. Because God needed me to get a message and and he knew if there was one thing my buddy would be able to do, that was just get that message through to me. You have to understand, I, I love my buddy like a brother. And I, I hope he's doing better. But he had some serious control issues. Serious, serious control issues. At the same time, Me and him were like brothers. And I knew that damn well if he was giving me a message, it was meant to be. And with everything going on, I mean, that's your kids, man. That's your kids. Anybody that's got kids out there, just imagine just being ripped out of their lives just like they were dead. And nothing you can do. Because any damn thing you do, you look like the bad guy. That's a hell of a lone feeling. And I got the message I was supposed to get from my buddy. But I had to get out of there because I was about to whoop his ass. He controlling like you wouldn't believe. Um, 
So I wound up getting out of there before that happened. But I got the message that God needed me to get, and that was to be still and let him work. So I spent a good period of time with my nose. I wound up going and staying with another friend for a short time. And um, she she's probably the, the biggest loner. And I don't mean that with any disrespect at all. But she's probably the biggest loner that I've ever met in my entire life. Um... Again, I don't mean that disrespectful. She's a good person. Um, just very, very, very different. And so, I mean, you really couldn't even have that many conversations <laughs> with her. Uh, and she wasn't around very much. So I'm sitting there all by myself. Part of me scared shitless because... I dealt with PTSD before all of that nonsense. So it was raging at that point in time. And so I stuck my nose in that Bible. And I talked to God every day. Most of the day. I spent a lot of time doing as deep, deep dives as I possibly could. Learning about different belief systems, reading the Word of God out of my Bible, asking questions, most importantly, asking questions. And let me tell you something. I'm persistent. I am a very, very persistent person. If I set my mind to something, you can bank on it. And I was going to get to the bottom of several things. Some of those things I could find online, some of those things I could find in the Word, and other ones I had to ask the Father. And there had been several times I had been aggravated as all get out. Because I felt like I needed the answers to something. And for whatever reason, I wasn't, wasn't ready for it. But there are some answers that I've gotten loud and clear. And there are some things that I've been told loud and clear. But it's not something that most people are going to have any clue about. And in fact, I would say most people would be likely to reject. Not asking anybody to put myself in between them and the Father. What I'm asking you to do is to hear what I say and test it. And I mean test it. Not just go by emotion, go by how you've been told all of your life. I mean actually go put in the work do the deep dives to verify the information that I'm saying and then of course talk to the father but and then make a decision on how you feel what you think because ain't nobody nobody supposed to be t between you and the Father. Nobody. Except Yeshua. That's a given. I, um, real quick, before we get any further, I, I was, uh, actually kind of nervous about tonight's show because I don't talk about this stuff. And for good, I, I that's good reason for me, because I don't want to be in between. Um, and so it makes me nervous when I do, for some odd reason. And, and um, I got another little message tonight from the Father, loud and clear, and it was really nice. 
when I was at my one buddy's house, the one that I went to for a while that was to give me a message, um, I was having a really, really rough time one night. And all of a sudden, just out of the blue, it wasn't that I heard the song anywhere or anything like that. Just out of the blue, I started hearing my dad singing. Now, my dad's been gone for a while. I started hearing him singing and playing You Are My Sunshine, which was one of the songs that I just would melt when he would play. And it was, it was in a sense of saving grace when I heard that. It was a very, very rough, very low time. I don't often hear stuff like that. But tonight, before the show, um, Oliver Anthony is doing a, a, a live charity event tonight on YouTube. And so I had it playing before the show, and lo and behold, uh, one of the songs that he started playing was Will the Circle Be Unbroken, another one of my dad's favorites to sing and play. And as Oliver Anthony's doing his, his live performance, I could hear Dad along with it. And it was, it was incredible to get that reassurance. And I, I know it's whatever, 36 minutes in or so, and I know I'm not there yet, but it's really important that I gave you all that backstory. Because what I'm going to say is going to go against every single thing you've ever been taught. Chances are high. If you're a Christian, chances are real high. My intent is not to upset anybody, piss anybody off. I want you to test what I am saying. I want you to pray on it. That's important. Do not let me or anybody else make your decisions as far as the Father is concerned. So, I want to mention angels real quick. Angels are an interesting thing, especially when you do a little bit of a compare and a contrast. Do you know that for the longest time, the only ones that in their mind saw a winged humanoid when they heard the word angel were Christian Americans? You probably should wonder why. Nobody else, no, nobody else envisioned uh, a humanoid with wings as an angel. It never, but Christians, especially in the United States and America, have been indoctrinated with this. Don't know why. The only reason I want to point that out to you is to show you that Christian Americans, American Christians, however you want to word it, have their own little subsets of, of tradition, if you will. And then you have the larger, the larger group that considers themselves Christians. Well, there's one thing that I had always heard from the get-go. If, if you wanted to be a Christian, you had to give in to one thing. There was one thing right off the bat that you had to accept and say that that was true. And it actually has to do with today. That was that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins. Now, I feel uncomfortable anytime somebody approaches, and, approaches with me and says, you have to believe this or else you're out of the club. I am very suspicious any time I ever hear that because why? Because that's a cult. 
That's indoctrination. That is a cult. That is something that a cult leader says. You either believe this, right? Same with the fire and brimstone preaching. And, and again, we, we need a balance. It's not that the everything's okay and everybody's going to go to heaven nonsense. And it's not everybody's going to go to hell and we're going to die tomorrow either. Okay? you got to have a, a balance. you got to have a happy medium in there. But I was told that from the get-go that you had to believe that he died on the cross for your sin. And I felt uncomfortable with that. Why? Because you're telling me that? No, it is written. It is written in there. But here's where I need you to do some work. This is where I, the homework comes in, right here. Do, and I'm serious. Do a deep dive on this. Please, please. I want you to be as sure of it from what you see. There's a whole lot of different religions around the world. And, and the most interesting thing is, is a whole lot of them, you can layer on top of one another and pretty much see a carbon copy. Their names would be different, this and that would be different, but it would be the same story over and over and over. There is one big change in that story with the Christian version and every other story that I've heard. Every single other religion, there is one major difference. Can anybody guess what that is? I'm just going to have a sip of coffee. I'm not expecting you to answer. <laughs> That one difference, major difference, is the part where he dies on the cross for our sins. Their story's a little bit different. Again, I'm telling you to test this. Please test this. Because when you see it, you're going to be like, holy cow. So, tell me, the Hopi, the Mayans, any of those. Did the story end up that the dude was nailed to a cross and died and your, for your sins? and all, is, that how this, is that how it went? Because it's not. Not even close to how it goes. But you have to understand what their stories are saying and what the Christian story isn't saying. I mean, it does to an extent. Okay, it does say, but I, it, there's, there's so little focus and so little attention. And without having things like Enoch and Jasher, figuring this stuff out would be really hard. That's important. You have to read the Apocrypha, especially Enoch and Jasher. What you'll find out is that the full Bible, again, you got to read the Apocrypha, was very serious about giving us a warning. I have said it a ton of times, and I'll continue saying it because it's a fact, that revelation is a pull shift, and we, we have one that we're on the cusp of. But a pull shift happened two other times in the Bible. One of them times was Noah's Ark. And the other time isn't so pronounced because the focus is pulled away from it for some reason. I'm not going to make any accusations or anything, but, but for some reason the focus is pulled away from it. But do you know that there are great changes upon the earth immediately after the death of Yeshua? And again, the Christian story on the cross. 
Do you know that there was big earthquakes and tidal waves? and Because that's something that gets glossed over a lot. There was a pole shift at that time. If you go and you look at any other belief system, the story will tell you about the upcoming pole shift. It'll be much more focused on preparing for the upcoming pole shift. And instead of some guy getting nailed to a cross for your sins, he's telling everybody to get ready and go in the caves. Hmm. Well, what was Noah's story? Right? Nobody would listen to him. Nobody would listen to him. He kept trying to tell everybody, it's going to start raining. You better get ready. You better do something. It's going to start raining. And everybody ignored him. They laughed at him. Remember, they were eating and drinking and being merry. The same thing happened in Yeshua's time as well. The very same thing. And the story got a little bit twisted. Somewhere, somehow, I'm not going to make any accusations. But you need to know that the story was twisted quite heavily by the same people that were to ha would have you worshipping trees, worshipping uh, bunny rabbits and Easter eggs, signs of fertility, the, the same group that would have you doing that kind of stuff, which is absolutely... Um, the more you know, the more you know. And that's why I'm saying, test my word. Go look at these other belief systems if you don't believe me. And see the stark contrast and difference in between how things play out. But then most importantly, ask God yourself. I can't promise you he'll answer, but at the same time, I don't honestly know a whole hell of a lot of people that have that close of a personal relationship with the Father. If I did, there'd be a lot more people with me telling this. Maybe you got to have your kids ripped away from you and have absolute everything of the world removed from you so that you can focus on that one thing so you can have that relationship. I'm not advising anybody go through that. But I am saying it's not necessarily easy to obtain either. Not always easy to keep. Evil loves to do everything it can to get in the way of the Father. That's a fact. Like I said, and that's the long and the short of it. Uh, there's it's not a lot I can say other than the fact that you need to go read how the other stories play out if you want to know the truth because I've done said it that the great deception started at the council of Nicaea and it continues today and it is the Christians that is the great deception people can argue it all they want but you can't show me anywhere in the Bible where it talks about Saint Nick, Christmas trees, Easter bunnies, and Easter eggs. You can't show me anywhere in the Bible where it talks about that stuff. Nowhere. But yet they are the pinnacles of that belief system. Tell me something ain't wrong with that. 
Again, I was atheist because I could read and I could comprehend. I'm not kidding. I knew something was up with that. And it took a long time. It took way beyond that 2005. I had to have that alone time, that one-on-one -on -one time with the Father for me to be able to focus enough, for me to be able to pri prioritize enough in order for me to learn. Why was I doing the things I was doing? It was my whole life culminating together. And it finally made sense why I, my entire life went from one thing to another, learning how to do this, how to do that. But I can't urge you enough to, to look into what I'm saying. Pray to the Father about it. And understand that the story was changed. And the story was changed so that you would have no idea. You would have no idea what was coming. You would have no idea what you were supposed to do. Knowledge is power. And with that, without that information, they could completely run roughshod over your life. And that is exactly what they're doing. It. They're doing it with the climate control agenda. They're doing it with all this LGBTQ nonsense. The Bible predicts a lot. But there's a lot more than what it's got to say. E well, even just in the Apocrypha, Enoch, Jasher, just those two additional books right there will teach you loads beyond. But you need to read all of the Apocrypha. You need to test every bit of it. I would advise you to put Romans down not legitimate but the other books of the Bible are legitimate absolutely everything except for Romans and all of the Apocrypha then you'll know at least you'll be on a much better uh, footing but if you really really want to know you got to go beyond and before the Council of Nicaea that was when the two different groups of people, you know, that were responsible for J Yeshua's death, or, well, at least in the Christian story, they crucified him. They indeed crucified him, but you just read the other stories. Um, but those same two groups of people that conspired against Yeshua are the ones running the show now. Are the ones that's got folks worshiping Christmas trees and Easter bunnies. Just saying. Just saying. They might, they might have been misleading you on some other things too. Maybe. Eh, maybe. But if I was going to look for something that they might be misleading me for, or misleading me with, maybe I would start out with the number one thing. They demand, I say, for me to be in the club. That's probably an important place to start looking. 